Good morning. We're going to go ahead and uh, hopefully get started. And again, we just want to welcome you to Community Bible Church. We're excited to have you here. Of course, excited to have Dr. Ed Welch with us and uh, looking forward to the conference. This is obviously issues that we all recognize, how I think all of us either struggle with it or know someone who's struggling, and it's just a reality in our culture today. So we're excited to have Dr. Ed Welch here speaking on some issues that I think all of us can relate to. I'm the pastor here at Community Bible Church. I was uh, in New Jersey for 12 years, and that's when I first heard of Dr. Ed Welch. Uh, he is a, a counselor for over 30 years and uh, a faculty member at CCEF, Christian Counseling and Educational Foundation, which is uh, tied to Westminster Theological Seminary, which is up in Philadelphia area. So he, most people in Philadelphia are in better moods today. Um, uh, Woohoo! Uh, so they're a lot nicer up there right now, I think. Just uh, Philadelphia, a lot of their angst has been solved uh, this past year. But anyway, uh, I got to know uh, Dr. Welch mainly through his books and just have been so encouraged. Uh, read his book on addiction, which was excellent. Um, Shame Interrupted. Uh, when, God is, I mean, when people are big and God is small, which is another excellent one. And so there's just been a, a Stubborn Darkness, which was on depression. So he'd been very helpful for me. And what I appreciated the most was he was able to take biblical concepts and connect them to uh, the psychological world. And I think uh, anyone that can do that, uh, the Bible is going to have those answers, is going to address some of those things. Um, but he can tie that to what's going on in our world today. And so I just appreciated his ability to do that. And so we were excited to get him to come down. And so um, without further ado, would please welcome Dr. Ed Welch. We are very grateful to be here. There might be some ways that I revealed that I'm from out of state. Uh, and, and, and for example, one way is that I, I, I noticed there was some coffee called community coffee. And I said, Isn't that, that is just the coolest thing, that a church has their own brand of coffee. And I've never heard of that. That's just, that's just, yeah, maybe they make a little more income from it. It's, it's a, so, that, I mean, that's just one way I will reveal that I'm not quite um, from, from the state. If other ways I might reveal it, I ask you to forgive me and overlook offenses and, and things such as that. But it's great to be here. Uh, and I'm looking forward to our day. Uh, here's, here's what we're thinking. You know, I, I, there, there are a bunch of reasons and questions that we have as we come, but, but here, here's some of the reasons that I think animate us as we're together. There are, there are some problems of living. We all have problems of living. Here's what we know. In this world, you will have trouble. And, and, and it seems, as we read through the New Testament, that's an understatement. We will have lots of trouble, and it will be persistent, sometimes relentless trouble. So, so, so that, that includes all of us. There are, there are some troubles that are a little bit more difficult to, to understand. And, and so we're, you know, I, guess the, I guess the area we're thinking of is, 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 is things that are the purview of modern psychiatry, and, and a bit the purview of modern psychotherapy. There are problems that are especially intractable, that seem, that seem very difficult to understand. And, and here's, the, here's the challenge, um, that, that when it's difficult to understand, and when it's difficult for people to identify what it's like, it seems as though scripture can be a bit silent. It, it, our sense is that scripture can speak to sort of the ordinary, mainstream, common problems, but there are other, there's this other category of problems that are different. And, and scripture is not quite equipped to, to deal with such things. So, so that is certainly going to be one of, one of our interests. Does scripture speak to, to these problems that have been eh, somewhat quarantined from scripture, where there seem to be other experts, and we're not, from, for the most part, we're not among them. One of the problems that we will encounter for, for problems we don't understand is that, that occasionally the bold among us will assume that we understand it and we will say foolish things to the other person. So that's, that's one side. 
The other side, which is probably more frequent, is if somebody has a problem that, that we don't immediately understand, that doesn't seem to be addressed very clearly in Scripture, we are going to move away from that person. And that person is going to feel increasingly isolated, as if somehow they're a bit of a pariah, their struggle is different than everybody else. They're a bit of a marginalized, outcast person. So these are some of the problems that we're trying to trying to understand. Here's where we're going. We, we, would like, we would like to see Scripture move farther and farther out to, to capture, to embrace these problems that we don't necessarily always find in Scripture. We would like Scripture to move out and sort of gather them in in a way where as a family those who struggle with these problems are a little bit more willing to speak about them. Could you imagine that? Uh, for, for those, I'll narrow it this way, for those who are taking psychiatric medications to actually be willing to speak about it to the rest of us. Can you imagine that? There are in, in every single church, whether it's a church of 10 or a church of 1,000, there, there, are, there are those among us who are taking psychiatric medications and we are afraid to say it to anybody else, in part because sometimes we have spoken to another person and it has not gone well. Could you imagine, could you imagine what would it be like to have a family where, where we can speak about these things together? Where, could you imagine somebody who's struggling with problems that are a little bit different than, than, than what our problems might be? Could you imagine them coming to the body and saying, pray for me, help? Uh, could, could you imagine such a thing? And could you imagine that, that the body is able to move toward them and help and be truly helpful? H- have the other person on their heart. That's what we're hoping. We, we all grow in, in just one step or two as, as we gather together. As you realize, there's, there's three problems that we're going to address. We'll talk about anxiety. Now we'll talk about depression uh, later this morning. And then we'll talk about guilt and shame, but probably mostly about shame this afternoon. These are all prominent problems. And, and it seems as though the, the expertise with these problems is increasingly outside of Scripture and outside of the church. And can Scripture move out and and gather them in? So, let's begin with anxiety or or fears. In in, in the land of psychiatry, this would be the, the the, the largest category that exists. There are more problems within sort of this land of fears and anxieties than any other psychiatric diagnosis. For example, you have specific kinds of fears. There there was an era where when we would have people over for dinner, I think I I was probably thinking about fear and writing about fear. I would ask people at the dinner table, do you have any particular fears? And it was always fascinating because, because what would happen is they would mention one particular fear, you know, airplanes, public speaking, the, you know, sort of the, the, the typical ones. And then once they would get one, they'd be able to find a second. Once they found a second, they were able to find a third. And, and, and on and on and on. It was, it, 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 do you think I'm weird? <laughs> Would you be reluctant to come to my house for dinner uh, if I'm going to ask these kinds of questions? Uh, think of some of the, uh, the diagnoses that are out there. Specific kinds of fears and phobias. Specific things that we want to avoid. Generalized anxiety. In other words, you just feel really anxious. You have no idea why, and it just seems to take over at no particular reason. Panic attacks. Panic attacks, by the way, which which seem to be increasingly popular. Uh, Everything is more popular these days within the the realm of anxiety and fear, but panic attacks seem to be especially popular. And some of you might have some thoughts on, on why that is. Paranoia, where we have fears that that seem 
that seem to don't quite fit the, the data. You know, these are just some of the words that, that are out there in this world of fear. Here's, this is a good place to start, by the way, because, because, because there, there are these, these fears that seem a little bit more life-dominating, and there are experts for these, but all of us can find something of fear and anxiety in our own soul. So why don't we do this? As we, as we move into this morning, it might be more difficult for you with depression because some of you are familiar with it, but, but some of us are not. With fears and anxiety, if you are a human being and sentient in some way, you are familiar with fears and anxieties. For some of us, it might be background noise. For some of it's in the foreground. But, but let's at least start there. So, so take a moment... What are your fears and anxieties? This is, this is typical of scripture, isn't it? It's, we, we, want to, we, we would like to be able to, to love those who, whose struggles just to seem more intense and intrusive. But scripture typically says, and you, and you. What, let's, let's begin with you and, and see how the spirit and the word minister to you. In your particular struggles, then, then somehow we become more equipped to be able to, to minister to others. So think about your own anxieties, if you would, just for a moment. Um, I won't ask my wife what my anxieties are. Well, maybe I should. Um, should I ask you what some of my anxieties Would you like to help? Finances. You, you know, you're, you're very sweet. You are very kind to do that. Uh, fears of finances, which you are the weirdest person in the world because, because you don't seem to worry about finances. And so I have, I have no idea how that can be. Um, but, but I do. Um, I've had panic attacks in my life before. Um, let's see. I, my, children tend, my children and my grandchildren tend to call her. And, and when I'm there... When she doesn't say anything right away, I always think the worst. Uh, you know, because you know, there's there, there's that ten seconds. Oh, hi. Uh, there's that ten seconds where it's ambiguous. Is she receiving the worst possible news? And I'm waiting for her to say, "Oh no, I'm so sorry." So I, did you know that? You didn't know that? Okay, good, good. Uh, so I got my groove on here. Uh, I'm, I'm just. <laughs> We, we're assuming that all of us struggle with fears and anxiety. So this is a, a nice way to move in. There's some of us who specialize in it and it tends to be more life-dominating. But, but this is something that, that we will find in, in all of us. Basic idea seems to be, well, very simply, something bad is going to happen. We're not always sure what the bad thing is. But, but anxiety and fear, it, it's, we're, we're, we're assuming the role of prophet, if you will. And, and we, are, we are fairly certain in our prophecy. <laughs> Something bad is going to happen. I don't know exactly when the bad thing will happen. Uh, but something bad is going to happen. So it's usually some kind of prediction of the future. Today, this is going to happen. Tomorrow, this is going to happen. Uh, and sometimes it does, but it rarely, it rarely does according to our prophecies. <laughs> our, our prophecies, if we notice them, they're almost inevitably wrong, at least in the details. Even though in this world we will have trouble, and today we will experience new troubles. So the basic idea of anxiety seems to be that... <sighs> that something bad is going to happen. And, and we are... Well, let me, let, me, let me just move it into Scripture right away. We are these little sheep. Isn't that beautiful? It, it's, it's, I'm, 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 I'm citing Luke chapter 12 here. Jesus says to us, you are these little sheep. We... we it, there's some... See how scripture just sort of comes out and grabs us right away? Isn't that, isn't that precious? Where, the, where Jesus himself is saying, I can understand why you have reasons for your anxiety. 
because you are a little person and you can't control the least of things. You, you can't control what's going to happen in the next minute. You, you are dependent on so many people every day. And life truly does seem to be at a pace that is out of control. Little sheep. Little, little lamb. It, it, Jesus is, is, is addressing us as, as weak people who are incredibly vulnerable. And, and if we are not close to the shepherd then life feels massively out of control. Here's, here's what's happening in the, the world of anxiety. What I'm going to do is I'll, I'll just you know, give, a, give a brief overview of some of the things that are happening, and then, and then we'll, we'll do two things, essentially, each time we're together. We want to move toward and begin to listen to the person who struggles with anxiety. And then we want to consider together what are the things that scripture has to say. Here are some some things that are happening in the the world of anxiety that might be worthwhile for us to consider. One is, like all psychiatric problems, anxiety is on the increase. Why that is, it's, I don't understand. Uh, but, But there is more anxiety and in and, and more dominating anxiety than, than ever before. So that's one thing we know. We also know that, that, that people seem to be a little concerned about medications for anxiety because, because although medication can help, medication over a longer period of time taken regularly, it, it, it can have disadvantages. So, so often medication is sort of an as-needed kind of thing. So there's still medication, and people are doing research on these things all the time, but, but, but the activity is not necessarily in the land of pharmacology. The, the activity is, is in yoga. I, I don't know what it's like here, but there are yoga studios everywhere. No matter where I go, there are yoga studios, studios and there are various reasons for the yoga studios. One is an interest in health and in maintaining health, but another is the world is out of control and is there a place where I can find some kind of serenity? A word that you might hear every single week. It's mindfulness. And, and what is mindfulness? Mindfulness is, here's all, this, all these noises clamoring for my attention, and, and I am insufficient to be able to respond to them and manage them and breathe, breathe. It's, it's is there some kind of way that I can be focused on the present without hearing all the clatter of life? Mindfulness is, is I, hear it, I hear it from professional athletes, I hear it from politicians, I hear it from, from housewives, I hear it from even some men. Okay. And, and, and men, by the way, are usually the last ones to acknowledge their fears. Uh, uh, male fears tend to come out in anger. Um, because we're out of control, and, and anger is a good way, it's a good feeling to try to bring control into an out-of-control world. But even, even the men among us are considering breathing and, and walks in, in sort of gentle places to try to, to, try to just delay the, uh, the fears that come at us. So this is happening absolutely everywhere. All right, let's, let's either move towards someone else or let's give voice to your own anxieties. Find words for this. This is, this is what we do in a community. This is what we do with each other and this is what we do with God himself. We, we begin by simply, this is what it's like. So, what's it like? Let's, let's, let's consider both images. What's it like for you? And, and let's move towards somebody else. For example, 
I, I was, the, the, the details of the panic attacks I've had are probably not that important. But my wife and I were going out to dinner. My, my tendency is to be more interested in other people than, than I tend to be in revealing myself. My wife and I were out to dinner with some friends, and, and I think I might have mentioned in passing that I had some panic attacks recently. And, and I, was, I was sort of hoping that nobody would say anything. And all of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden somebody's jaw dropped. I said, what? <laughs> and, and this is all they said. Please, tell us more. Please, tell us more. You don't need to be an expert to ask that question. And for the next 40 minutes, they, they kept essentially saying, tell us more. Tell us more. Now, is it any surprise to you that, that of, the, of the various ways that the Spirit and the Word met me, is it any surprise that that, that was, was probably the most potent balm for my own soul? <laughs> Simply some friends who weren't trying to solve it, uh, they, they tell us more. And, and, and I think here's, here's the important part of it. When they told us more, rather than simply say, well, have you tried this? Have you tried this? Have you tried this? Have you tried this? Rather than that, they were simply affected by the things that affected me. Here's, here's the nature of the family of Christ, that, that we live in this intensely personal world. And, in, and, and, and what that means is, is before our God... We speak to him. We speak to him because he invites us to speak to him. And then the crazy thing is, he is moved by what we say. He is moved with compassion by the things that we say. Who would have thought? That's that's what happens when you love somebody. You are moved by the troubles in their hearts. And then he speaks to us. And we are moved by the things that he says. We are affected by them. Back and forth. Back and forth. This is the nature of life with our God. And as a result, this is the nature of of the community that Jesus Christ superintends. His body, his people, his church. How are you? Tell me more. I'm so sorry. We, and we, we, we carry the other person on our hearts. Those are, who would have thought in such, such simple things that, that the Lord would do such profound care toward one another? So, what's it like for you? Tell us more. Who are you? What are some of the fears that tend to, tend to sneak in to your own life? Tell us more. By the way, in the back of my mind here is a passage in in Ephesians chapter 4. It's it's the most extraordinary passages. It it says that that we live in a community where pastors and teachers and evangelists and others, what they do is they equip us to do the work of caring for one another. Who would have thought? In the Old Testament, who were the experts? You had the priests, you had the kings, you had, you had prophets who occasionally would speak into somebody's life. But in the New Testament, as the Spirit is given to all of us, we ourselves are called to care for each other. Who would have thought? And, 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 and all of us, when we think about that personally, most likely all of us can remember how one particular person, inadvertently, non-expert, they simply showed us love and they simply said something like, tell me more and I'm so sorry. And in that, Christ met us. So we probably all have illustrations for, for how ordinary friends can be used in extraordinary ways. So, we're talking about anxiety. There are there are features of anxiety that we, we can, can Scripture reach them? And this is the way we're beginning. We're moving toward each other. And we're saying, speak openly from your heart. Tell me more. And we are moved by the things that we, see, we hear. 
friends of ours, a, a family who, they're, just, they're, they're, they're wonderful friends, and, and they have a, a son who has a, a disfiguring disease that will take his life any, any, at any possible moment. And have you ever woken up in the morning and it was a beautiful morning like this and for a moment you appreciated the beauty of the morning but then all of a sudden it's, there's a sense something is not quite right. Something is not quite right. And all of a sudden, the, the problems of life become, they, they, they sort of move in on you. Oh, that's right. My son has an incurable disease, and I don't know what tomorrow holds. Oh. It, it, it's, it's the way life works so often. What's it like for, for this particular couple? Every day is, is this burden of... Of, of, of loving their son and walking with him, knowing the difficulties of, of an illness that, that will never be treatable. I got a call yesterday from, from a friend who is 66 years old, and, and, his, and, and, and his fear was that his wife was going to leave him after 40 years, yesterday she, she announced that she wanted to leave. The, the anxieties that he has lived with, and they actually have come to fruition. And, 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 and the anxieties that plague him today. These are, these are the kinds of things that are all around us and are in us. Put, put, put voice on, on your own anxieties. Put, put voice on your own fears. Is there, is there a sense of, of life, is, life is, is, is one threat of failure after another? <laughs> that, 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 that the things that you have to do, it's impossible to be competent in them all. <laughs> And failure is always looming. It, by the way, it, what we're doing right now, it, it's, it, it sort of seems very simple and ordinary. But, but again, it, it, it really is extraordinary. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to be faithful to how Scripture works. And, and this, what we're, trying, we're not trying to be nice. We're, we're, we're trying to be... We're trying to be Christians. And, and we live in a community where, where we are invited to speak. In, in other words, apparently, these things are very important in the mind of God. That there's no other re- he, He's the God who knows us. He knows the things that are our hearts before we even speak them. But somehow, for some reason, as in any good relationship, he wants us to work to speak these things to him, and he values us doing that kind of work, and he values those words, and he is moved by them. So, this is not just step one. This is an extraordinary phenomena that happens in this, king, in this community of heaven, where the Lord himself invites us to speak. So, Speak. Where are your own anxieties? As you move toward others. Really? Please, tell me more. Tell me more. How are you doing? Got some? Got some anxieties in mind? A few fears? Let me pray for you. Father, would you grant us, we, we, we want this to speak to our own souls, and we want to somehow be part of a community that, that loves well, and invites other people to speak to things that are on their own hearts, things that perhaps were one time a bit shameful. Would you grow us in this? In the name of Christ, amen. Now, since anxiety is something that all of us experience, we're not going to take quite as much time to to sort of prime the pump, if you will, to hear, is, is it like this, is it like this, is it like this? Let's, there are two things we're going to be after this, you know, this morning and this afternoon. 
What is it like? Tell me more. How are you? And then we're going to sort of turn to the next question, which is, what is it that God says? What is it that God says? With anxiety, it's going to be a little bit easier. With depression, it's going to be a little bit more challenging. Because with anxiety, the, it's, it's, the pickings are right there. We, we can find it all through Scripture. With, with some of these other problems, it might be a bit more challenging. So we're, we're sort of starting with an easy one. We all struggle with anxieties. What is it that, that God says to us? The first thing is this. Speak from your heart to the Lord. Psalm 62, 8, which is a particular text, but it really captures all the Psalms. Trust in the Lord at all times. Pour out your heart to him. Pour out your heart to him. Uh, the anxieties I, the text I've, I'm, I'm referring to probably happened what, two years ago or so, something like that, two three years ago, uh, and and and, and the, the the most prominent attack it happened in, during the night, and it, it was it was like an earthquake. I knew there was no going back to bed after this. It really felt like the landscape of life had changed. Went out into our living room and and, and Lord was very gracious to me. I began to meditate on particular scripture. And it didn't help at all. You know, but, but it was, I'm glad that I was able to meditate on Scripture. Uh, it, it, didn't, it didn't keep the, sort of these intrusive images at bay, but so it was. So it was. Uh, the next day, still considering these things, I realized that one thing I did not do, I didn't say, Jesus, help me. I went to Scripture. And, for example, I went to Philippians chapter 4. Think of, in your anxieties, think about those things that are good and true. So I was trying to think of all these things that were good and true, and they would last for around a half a second, and then all these other ugly things would come and overtake me, and I'd try it again. Uh, well, I never said, Jesus, I feel like I'm going to die. I have a sneaking suspicion I probably won't die. I feel bad that I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about dying and I, I, should, be, I should welcome it. Uh, and you know, maybe, maybe I don't mind dying, except there are certain ways I would rather not die. And in this particular way that I'm envisioning, I'd rather not die that way. Help. I'm a mess. I, one of the easiest things to do, in some ways... The, Throughout our, our, our day, what we want to do is we want to grow up to be little children. That's, that's the curious means, that's the curious aim of growth in the Christian life. That, that we want to grow to be people who recognize that we can't manage our world and we can't manage our troubles in ourselves. And, and the most profound thing that we can say is, Jesus, help. And then to say to each other, help. So as we begin to move from being able to recognize that we have these struggles, as we turn to Scripture and, and ask what does Scripture say, the first thing we hear is Jesus says, talk to me, speak to me. Speak to me from your heart. And when he says speak to me from your heart, what he's saying is, is it's not that I'm indifferent to the eagles, uh, you know, but... But there's things that are more important than the eagles. There's things more important than, than it, it's... What are the things that are really important to your soul? What are the things that you love? What are the things that you love that are under siege? What are, the, what are your fears? What, what are the, where is the oppression in your life? When does failure seem to, seem to erode your very foundation? These are the things that, that when we move to Scripture, it's the first thing we hear. Speak of these things. I guess the question is now, what else? What else is it that, that the Lord says to us? Here's probably the, probably the first thing to consider is, is what is God's attitude going to be toward us as we speak. Especially in light of, when it comes to anxiety, there are, there are scores of passages that say, stop it! 
right? Don't be anxious, which, which it doesn't seem like that would lend itself to a whole lot of back and forth, uh, yeah? uh, where you know, we speak and the Lord is moved by us and he speaks in return. It, it's, it's sort of a conversation stopper. Uh, it, it's... Hmm. Uh, children, and when the children were younger, uh, if they, when, when they were going to school, if, or especially if they were driving one of our cars, uh, um, be careful, be careful. Uh, I, I would usually say something like that. What did be careful mean? It, it meant, it did not mean... These are your mom and dad's cars, and you better be really careful with it. If it comes back with a dent, you are in trouble. It didn't mean that. It meant, we love you. And, 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 and driving is, can, can, can sometimes be a bit hazardous. And, and we want the best for you. So be careful. You, you, you see the difference between the two. They, they both were technically in the command form. Be careful. But it was this, this heart of love. In that Luke chapter 12 passage, it captures it. It, it begins with don't be anxious. But, and it seems like stop it, but it ends with don't be afraid, little flock. Don't be afraid, little flock. In other words, what scripture says to us is, what the Lord says to us is you will be anxious. And, 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 and I'm thinking of passage in the Psalms, I guess it's Psalm 4, 50, 56, 56. When I am afraid, I will turn to you. In other words, I will be afraid. Uh, but when I'm afraid, I will, I will turn to you. I, I've been reading uh, C.H. C. Spurgeon recently, and I, I read a letter from Spurgeon, the, the Baptist pastor from the 1800s. He, there was an anxious man in his congregation who was speaking of his anxieties. And Spurgeon very graciously looked for ways to encourage him. And this is the way he signed his letter. I am your anxious friend. Write again, C.H. Spurgeon. I am your anxious friend. Spurgeon understood God's attitude toward, toward us and our anxieties. It's, it's an attitude of compassion. It's an attitude of, of tell me more. It's an attitude of, of course you're going to be anxious in this world. You, you, you are incredibly vulnerable and, and very difficult things happen. And they happen day in and day out. It, it, maybe it goes something like this. Let's go for a walk. Let's go for a walk together. Uh, I don't, I don't know what a walk notes to you, but, but uh, one of the things that I enjoy, especially with my wife, which, which is a bit of a difficulty in Pennsylvania at this particular time because there's snow, but it's to go for a walk. There's something, there's something about going for a walk, which there aren't the distractions at home, there aren't all the other things that have to be done because we're out of the house. And there's, there's a certain kind of communion in that. Here's the way the Lord enters into your anxieties. You have good reason to be anxious. You have good reason to be anxious. And, and, and could, could we even say, this is going to be distressing for some of you, but you already know this. The older you get, the more anxious you will become. <laughs> How's that for a nasty prophecy? Uh, uh, what, what are you doing here? Okay, here's a guy saying you're going to become more anxious as you get older. Well, it's more, it's more complicated than that, but, but it, it, it's fairly simple. Where the older you get, the more, the more people, hopefully, you love. <laughs> and, and the more you love, the more, the, the more difficult things can happen to those that you love. And, and so we anticipate that our anxieties are going to increase. And in the midst of this, the Lord says, speak to me, and, and let's go for a walk. Isn't that sweet? Let's go for a walk. And, and I'm thinking now of these, these, these passages in Matthew 6 and Luke chapter 12, where cons- you see the birds there? You, look at the birds. And... And the birds, they, 
things seem to be fine in them, with them. Your heavenly Father cares for them. And, and you are so much more important than the birds, no matter how beautiful they might be. And there's, there's the grass. There are the azaleas that are in bloom. I am so jealous that you have azaleas in bloom all already. That's just ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, you're the azaleas in, in bloom. Aren't they beautiful? Uh, in another week, they're not going to be as beautiful. And, and, and I bring that beauty into creation for your benefit and for the bees' benefit as well, of course. Uh, I bring that beauty into creation. Don't you realize that these things that I care about that do, not, that do not have endurance and permanence, don't you realize that my interest in you is much greater? <laughs> because, because you do have an endurance in your relationship with me. <laughs> this is what Jesus says to us. Here, let's, let's go for a walk. And, and meanwhile, during this walk, you don't hear a word that he says. You know, I, my, my wife was saying something this morning. And... Uh, and I re- it's the kind of thing where I realized somebody was talking in the background, but, uh, but I didn't have a clue what she was saying. And then when she stopped, when she stopped talking, I realized I prob- there's something, she probably is asked a question right at the end of that, and I have no idea what it was. That's the nature of anxiety. So we're going for a walk, and Jesus is, let's talk about some birds and their relevance to you and their relevance to my care for you. And... and and grass of the field. And meanwhile, we are consumed by our anxieties. <laughs> and what does he do? <laughs> one time, one time uh, my, I had a young, my, my younger daughter at the time, we were sitting at a table and having breakfast. And it was, this, you're going to think this is a theme in my own life. My younger daughter was talking to me, and I wasn't paying attention to her words she was saying because I was thinking about the worries of the day. And... And I, I noticed again that she stopped, and, and I, I probably had a, a, a well-timed grunt, uh, good, Lise, good, good, which I thought probably handled the conversation. And then and, and there's some silence, and all of a sudden, this little girl comes over to me, and I'm sitting down, she takes my face, and she says, Daddy, look at me. Look at me. In other words, you're in la-la land somewhere, look at me. Well, perhaps Jesus might say, look at me, look at me. Because, because our eyes can wander so many places. And, and when our eyes wander, they will go. They will see some very hard things. Look at me, look at me. And then we respond. <coughs> Well, thanks for encouraging me in that way. But it is really hard to look at you in the midst of all these things that are clamoring for my attention. Help. Help. Help me to see. Help me to hear. You hear it? It's that back and forth. And, 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 and it didn't work. You know, you know we, Jesus' words to us, they didn't solve our anxieties. And our tendency is, is, is anxieties. They want answers right away. And so we race to some other place for answers. But, but Jesus says, look at me. And, and then we can confess that you know, it's, it's so hard to look at you with all this noise that's taking place. Help me to look at you. And then he continues to speak to us. And it is all going to surround that he is the God who comes close. That's, that's going to be the core of everything that he says. And in this, do you see how scripture has just offered us something that is revolutionary and it goes deeper than, than, than any other words could possibly go? Because Anxiety and fear is looking for a person. It's, it, it's, it's not intended to be solved by trying to find strategies to calm ourselves. Anxiety and fear, it's looking for the right person who might be able to help. 
It's looking for the right person who might be strong enough in whom we can, can trust. And so, so, you know, so, places, so whenever you see that call, don't be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. Inevitably, you will find something very close in the context. I am with you. I am with you. Now, here's, here's what we're anticipating. We are anticipating that usually we will not say, oh, oh I, I didn't know that. Thanks so much. I feel so much better now. Then off we go to our merry way and, and anxieties are over. We are not anticipating that. We, we are anticipating, but I can't see you. I, I can't feel you. You, you seem distant and somehow removed from these things. You see, you see the back and forth? The, the Lord speaks to us, and these are the kinds of things that we're able to see from our hearts. And, and we speak, and he speaks again. Now, at this point, it's, I, I could ask you the question, and what does he say? What are some of the riches in his word that speak to your own heart or you would like to speak to your own heart. There's potential in those words and if somehow they could become your own, you recognize that, that, that maybe we would be able to grow in casting our cares on, on him because he cares for us. So as you're thinking those things, what we're doing is knowing the person, speaking these things to the Lord, and then resting with this question, and what does the Lord say in response? What does he say in response? And, and, and what we are hoping for is he says so much that it's going to take us the rest of our lives to begin to uncover the treasures of what he says to us as anxious people. That's, that's what we are hoping for. So, so by 1015, we're going to stop, I suspect, at an awkward moment where it's, well, it'll be mid-sentence and wherever we stop, we could say dot, dot, dot. And there's more and there's more and there's more. And we're just beginning, we're just beginning to get a sense together of these beautiful things that God says. So let me, let me speak over your thinking for a moment and, and, and consider some other scriptures together. Here's one that, that, that leads me into prayer sometimes. It's a, it's a story from 2, Corinthians, 2 Kings chapter 6. And you're probably familiar with this. It's the story of Elisha. And Elisha has been given some knowledge of the king of Syria's war plans. And he communicates them to, to the Israeli king. Uh, the, some, and somehow the king of Assyria is, it, it recognizes that Elisha is the culprit... And he gets his army together, and he goes to where Elisha is. Now, Elisha has a, an, an assistant. And the assistant is the first one to see the Syrian army essentially surrounding them. And he is positively freaking out. He is, he is absolutely beside himself, as he should. And, and Elisha says... Essentially, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are greater than them. In other words, what is, what, is, what is the core of God's response to anxiety? I am with you. And then, then Elisha simply prays, Lord, open his eyes. And when his, you know, It's a beautiful story. When his eyes are open, not only is God with him, but the armies of the Lord of hosts are surrounding the Syrian army. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine if your eyes were open to see the creator God who was with you, who with a word is able to calm the storms? Do you imagine that? Well, there's, this is the kind of passage that leads us as anxious people to say, Lord, open our eyes, because all we can see is the horror that's potentially threatening us. 
Open our eyes so we can see this deeper reality that you are the God who is with us and you don't leave us and you don't forsake us. What what begins to speak to your own soul? The many things that the Lord speaks to anxiety and fear. Just, Just snatching a few things from Scripture. Of the failure in death. Failure, what will other people think of us? Financial ruin would be one category. The other category would be health. And, 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 and health ultimately leads to fears of death. I suspect many of us have more fears of death than, than we realize. Two kinds of fears with death. One is a fear of what's going to happen before you die and the way you are going to die. The other is a fear that's going to happen after you die. Uh, It gets you coming and going in a sense. Um, For example, a, a fear that is in the back of my mind is the way I would die. I... I don't want to die from asphyxiation, which is a bit of a problem because we all die, but we stop breathing at some point. Uh, So uh, I I, I would prefer to die in bed in the middle of the night on on the heels of a really a very serene dream. That's that's the way that I hope. And I... I was, um, was watching a movie with my wife a number of years ago, and, and um, one of my fears is I don't like the idea of being out of breath. And, and, and it, the problem is I've, I've actually experienced that before. I, I enjoy being around water and in water, and so I've experienced these near-drowning events, and there are people who will tell you that, that when, you're, when, when you're almost drowning, you, all of a sudden, everything just gets very peaceful. Have you ever heard that before? I think they're all lying. I think, I think every one of them are lying. I think, that's, I think, it's, a, I, I, I think it's a conspiracy. Um, I think it's miserable. Uh, so, so there was this drowning scene in there. And when I'm watching this movie, my palms are getting all sweaty. And, and I'm thinking, maybe it's time for me to deal with these particular fears more head on. What does that even mean? How would I deal with that? And, and in one of the... One of the ways that the Lord speaks to you is, is through an old story that he keeps, that, that reverberates throughout all these passages on fear. And it's a story on manna. And the story is, in the Old Testament is, he will give you the manna that you need for today. In the New Testament, the word grace might appear. He will give you all the grace that you need for today. And if you try to think about tomorrow, you know what's going to happen? It will positively freak you out. Because, because the grace that he gives is for today. And in tomorrow, there will be new grace for you. So what does this mean with drowning? It means that right now I'm not drowning. <laughs> and, and tomorrow I might. Well, yeah, there's a lot of water around here. So I, I guess it is possible. Uh, uh, but if I do, the Lord will somehow give me grace to drown as a Christian, and I don't know what that means. Uh, but I don't have to worry about that right now. It's, today I am not drowning. Today I have the privilege of being with kindred spirits to consider very important matters in Scripture. And my job is I want to grow in these things, as is yours. That's, that's what we have grace to do. It's, it's, the Lord doesn't promise us that the things we fear won't overtake us. But somehow he promises us, I will be with you in the midst of that. And probably all of us have illustrations. When we went through something difficult, we never thought we would be able to survive, and we did, because he was with us. Most of us have friends who have gone through really deep issues, and and they... They are acknowledging that God has been with them in the midst of it. It is, it is one of the most persistent stories in our community. That we will receive grace 
from our present God when we need grace. That's for before we die. And see, what we're doing is we're just, you know, just taking a few little samplings from Scripture. What about after you die? My own version of that oftentimes has been that, that there's going to be this long line, well done, good faithful servant, well done, good faithful servant, well done. And he gets to me and he rolls his eyes and he says, you're in on a technicality. You, 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 you claim Christ and you were baptized, but, you're, but go to the ghetto somewhere. Uh, that's, some version of that tends to, be, tends to be my thinking of the words that I would hear after I die. But, but you see, when you die, you will have this deluge of grace. You won't be there'll, be, there'll be more to come, but you'll have a deluge of grace. And, and the deluge of grace will be, you will be without sin, and you will know the triune God accurately. And here's what we know, that the triune God has, from the foundations of the world, has been committed to pursuing you and bringing you to his house in showing you his divine hospitality. That is the story of scripture. It's not, here are my children, they better not, oh, get out, get out. It, it, it's, excuse the illustration, but on the East Coast and Northeast, that's, that's what nuns used to do. <laughs> you're, you're out of line, oh, stop it. You get the ruler out and just, it's, no, the Lord is not waiting for us to get out of line so he can swat us. He is the one who, from the foundations of the world, has been committed to being with us as his people, drawing us into his house and, and, give, and leading us to his lavish banquet, which we don't bring anything to. Our eyes will be open to those realities when we see him face to face. The picture of heaven is we will know his love more clearly than we know it now. And if indeed there are sins that are raised, we will agree with him, we will be fully in tune with him, and we will be even more thankful for forgiveness of sins. That nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. What is he, what we're doing? We're, we're still thinking psychiatric problems. And, and in a sense, psychiatric problems, we all struggle with anxiety. Uh, but there are some problems that seem to be more life-dominating. What we're trying to do, we're trying to reach into those and, and simply ask the question, what is it that God says to us? And what can we offer to each other in the midst of our fears and anxieties? And, and the list never, ever ends, it seems. To know the God who is present and to look at him, to speak with him, to respond to him, and then to live today, to seek to love one other person in his name today. Instead of all the different anxieties, what is, what is in front of you? What is the work? Who is the person who's in front of you? And how can you work unto the Lord? How can you love the person who's in front of you? Those are, those are more or less the ways our conversations go. And, and the next day we say, Jesus, help. I hear what you say, and it sounds so incredibly beautiful. But here, frankly, it, it seems to be irrelevant to my own soul because these things seem so loud. Could you imagine this? Could you imagine a community where that's our experience? And, and we go to another friend and say, this is what's happening. My, uh, my anxieties overtake me. And I hear all these beautiful things in Scripture and they don't seem to be relevant to me. Could you pray for me? Could you pray for me that, that somehow the reality that Jesus is with me would, would enter into my bones in my experience where, and, and, and would open my eyes and I would, I would see more clearly. Could you imagine a community where we wouldn't be ashamed to speak of our fears and anxieties but, 
is we go to the Lord and we still seem stuck in them. We ask a friend, could you pray this particular passage for me? And, and perhaps we ask another person to pray for us. And, and most likely this is what's going to happen. I'll, I'll pray for you. But as, you're, as, you, as you mention these things, you know, I, I would, I'm going to, could you, would you pray for me as well? Because the things you're talking about, they're, they're, they're relevant to, to me, to you, to all of us. Would, would you be willing to pray as well? As you can tell, the, what we find in Scripture is not necessarily the solution to our anxieties. That where, where, we are, where we are unbothered by all the difficulties of life. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> I think it would be nice, but no, it wouldn't be nice because it wouldn't be consistent with love. If my, if my grandchildren were sick, if my grandchild's in, my, in the hospital, and I am somehow serenely indifferent and unmoved to those things, something's not quite right. So what Scripture is doing is, is how does it sound to you? It's in this world you will have trouble. And, and there isn't a guarantee that, that anxieties are going to dissipate. But, but there is a place we can go. There is hope in the midst of our anxieties. There is the opportunities to grow together in the midst of our anxieties. That is our, that is our mission. There are ways that we, in the midst of our anxieties, are able to grow more and more as little children. That's... That's, that's the good news in the midst of these things. To know that with forgiveness of sins, more things happen than we realized. That forgiveness of sins means indeed even our sins will not keep him from being present with us. Dot, da, 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 and so on and so on and so on. Here's, here's what we're thinking. It, I guess the question is, what about these psychiatric problems? Well, what? Scripture is not necessarily... Scripture, the Lord is very... There's a compassion in our God that when things are more dominating to us, His compassion is truly aroused. But here's, here's what we're thinking. That, that the anxieties that seem so severe, that seem like they're for the experts... We are glad that they're experts and, and glad and, 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 and even glad for medications that can sometimes just sort of alleviate the, the, the bodily experience of jumping out of our skin. But what we're looking for is, is the scripture comes underneath our anxieties and over our anxieties and around our anxieties and in our anxieties. That's that's, that's what we want to do. We want to take these experiences that somehow seem to be foreign and only for the experts, and we want to see how Scripture just, just envelops them in a way that invites us to speak to experts indeed, but also to speak with each other, to, to pray for each other. And so often in the midst of that, what we will find is in ordinary means of grace to each other, loving, wise, prayerfulness. And, and, and then following up, how are you? This is the way I've prayed for you. In ordinary ways of caring for each other, isn't, don't we anticipate, as we know how God works, that, that he changes us. He encourages our hearts together. And we become an increasingly united body that draws the world to the compassion of Christ. Good things, isn't it? Thanks so much for being here together to think about these important things. We're going to take a break now. We're going to take a break till 10.30. And, and, and I realize this time we did not have opportunities for question and answers. The next time we will. And, and obviously, I'm going to be around, so, so I'm, I would love to, to think about things together. And, 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 and if you're the kind of person who has burning questions, and I hope you do, that's, 
That's, that's part of what we hope. We want, we want one thing that we can run with, and we want a question that is burning. If you have a burning question, chances are people around you have a similar question. Ask, ask it of somebody else if you're reluctant to ask it of me. Let me pray. Father, your mercy on us today. Continue to open our eyes and encourage our souls in such a way that the body of Christ can be increasingly open with you and with each other. In the name of Jesus, amen.